I have 10 after five. Yep. And I can't see who the guests are. If somebody would tell me. I'll tell Hello? you. Hello? Yeah, well, we I'll tell you. It's Okay, Liz, Liz can do it. Yeah, it's uh, Liz, Phil, Dorinda, Chris McVeigh, Mark from the Budget Committee, Elias, Randy, Bill McInnes, Theo, Vic, and Sandy Levine, and Orca. Okay, so pretty much, pretty much the expected cast of characters. Yep. Yes. Welcome, everyone. Happy New Year. Um, are there any amendments to the agenda? No. I I just... Uh, the only... Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just sent I you just guys say, a, the only uh, thing an extended I want to talk agenda. About, whoa, 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 stop. One of us has got to talk at a time. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, I go just want to just... It's, this is me, Sarah. So just that the extent... <laughs> this isn't going to work. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> What's wrong now? People can't hear me? We can, we can hear you, Peter. <laughs> um, so there are no amendments to the agenda? Peter, this is the this only is Randy. The only amendment. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Randy. I, so, just a, a question a about meeting. process here. Um, do we need to make any uh, amendments uh, to this, Sarah? If the budget committee has recommendations for these, huh? just got done. Oh. Who's, who's talking? Randy, hey guys, I cannot. I cannot hear a thing when oh. everybody's talking. Please, you, Bill McKinnis, please. Me, it's Bill. You get hearing aids like these, and then you don't have to wear those. Yeah, but I can hear the meeting that's going on. You can with these. No. All right, I'm gonna and rock. I'm gonna mute people. everybody. Yeah, mute me. Fine. I don't want to talk. I guess I need. I got the audio shut off. Yeah. Uh, Who's, I can't, these it's Bill McManus. I so muted him. You. It's not muted. It's There. there. Peace. So the only amendment I have is that we need to have a quick discussion about what our plan is going to be going forward uh, for our select board meetings. That'll take just a couple of minutes. And also, I believe the legislature is considered going to consider, at least this is what I was told, consider what we can do about town meeting on the 6th, which is two days from now. So I don't know how we're going to deal with that, but maybe we need to have a special meeting once we know what what they're going to allow and what they're not going to allow. But you may know more about that, Sarah, than I know. But I just like to have a quick discussion about it. Okay, you know, Peter, you should probably just say over and out when you're done talking. That way, we know that when and no one in, interrupts you. But <laughs> Randy, Randy had a question, and so Randy, what's your question? Uh, just as a matter of process. Um... The budget committee has a couple of recommendations they'd like to put forth in front of the select board. Um, and I'm not sure if that's covered underneath your budget discussion already or not. Just a question. I would think it would be if it has to. I would say it. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. This, this really isn't working. I would say it's under the budget discussion, Randy. Thank you. I mean, assuming it pertains to the budget. It does. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So with that, um, we're going to start the budget discussion. I have printed out the latest uh, sheet, which Dorinda sent us today, and I presume everyone else has that in front of them. Um, the only other thing I have is that Steve did call me, and I don't know if he called you, Sarah, but he can't be at tonight's meeting. And obviously he isn't at tonight's meeting. So with that, uh, I guess, Dorinda, you're up for the budget discussion. Um, so the budget that I sent through was everything we had talked about at the last um, meeting. And um, my only concern in thinking about this over the last couple of weeks 
I don't know if this is an accurate representation to the voters if we don't somehow indicate that our plans is to still fund those two, um, the tennis court fund and the paving fund, but the money was coming out of the fund balance. And I think somehow that needs to be represented in the budget. And I'm not sure how we do it without affecting the bottom line of the budget. So can well, uh, what we'd have to what we'd have to do is 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 take it out of the uh, take it out of the line item where it is now and put it in those two line items. And if somebody asks the question, how come the select board discretionary has been reduced? We'll say because we chose to fund the tennis court and whatever it is. You're not does, doing doesn't it. that show the most? You're not doing it out of the discretionary. You're doing it out of the fund balance. Doing it out of the fund balance. All right. So what we need to do is, let me just think about that a minute. Randy has his hand up. Okay, Randy, go ahead. Um, so this this ties right into the, one of the recommendations that the budget committee um, discussed and voted on tonight. Um, and our recommendation is that the uh, general fund balance not be used to subsidize any of the budget line items in the town budget. Um, if we plan to, and that was our motion and what we voted on uh, there, um, but just as a matter of some of the back conversation, um, we feel like, that it's important to um, think about the capital improvement plan um, when we look at think about the uses of of some of the um, the the fund balance and potential future uses of that, along with um, all of the other things that traditionally the fund balance allows us to do, like for quarterly payments for taxes and and operational cash flow. Um, it it was during our discussion we felt that if if those items were intended to be funded, that they should be shown right up front as a matter of transparency for the voters. Got it, gotcha. Um, what's the total amount of money, Dorinda? For those two well, items? For those two items, one was, uh, let's see, I sent it through earlier. Do you, I don't have it in front of me. It um, was, we reduced the, go ahead. It was $10,000 from the paving fund, reducing that to a $20,000 line item and a $5,000 out of the tennis courts, reducing that to a $5,000 line item. And then you were eliminating two, um, you were reducing the roadside mowing. That was just going to be a reduction. And mm -hmm. the other one was uh, the emergency road repair. You were eliminating any budget for that. Yeah, we just chopped those two things out. So I don't have the minutes printed out in front of me. What we had agreed to was that we would take it out of the fund balance. Those yes. that ten thousand dollars and whatever whatever it was. Yes. I guess my recommendation would be we take all a thousand dollars out of the uh, select board discretionary money, which we never seem to spend anyway. And what what's that? Seven thousand, I think. Hold on. Eight thousand. <laughs> okay, so so we're short three thousand dollars. No, we're short four thousand dollars if we leave a thousand in the discretionary, right? No, because you're leave, mm -hmm. taking ten and five. You've got to come okay, up so with that's 15. thirteen. So we need twelve thousand. We're five thousand short. So my recommendation is we put that 5,000 back in there. 
In other words, in other words, however we do it, add the whole amount for the tennis courts and whatever the difference is. You understand what I'm saying? Well, what you would do is Inc zero increase, out. Increase the draft budget by $5,000 so we can fully fund the things we're intending to fund and move $7,000 out of the select board discretionary to make up the rest of that difference. So we will have effectively increased the budget by $5,000. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm trying to do it yeah. now. Okay. So can I can I speak once again? This is Randy. Sorry, Peter. Okay, Randy, go ahead. Um, uh, just before we get too far down the line, the other recommendation that the uh, budget committee discussed and voted on tonight um, was the recommendation for trying to uh, get the budget increase to 8.87% by reducing the COLA carried to 3% along with removing $2,000 from somewhere within the public works um, budget. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's talk about that as part of the The reason that the reason that I bring it up, I, is I mean, I don't I don't I, I just hate to do this in a random order. So I, I'd rather I'd rather hear from Dorinda and then and then consider what you're uh, what you're discussing, if that's OK. I mean, we're going to talk about it. Absolutely. OK, that, that's absolutely fine. I just didn't want to go too far down the road of messing with a bunch of line items when uh, the recommendation that we were that we were discussing was tied to the existing budget before it moved too much. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Well, we won't go ahead, Dorinda. Making those changes, it brings it up to 10.01%. So we've slipped over, we've slipped over 10.1%. And that probably means that Randy's changes, if they were adopted, what did you think it was going to break it down to Randy? Uh, eight point eight seven percent. Yeah, so it's probably more like nine percent if uh, if we do those other changes. But let's see what else. What other what other changes do we uh, or recommended changes do we have? Dorinda, anything? I don't have any changes. Those were the I just submitted the out the numbers that we had from the last meeting and um, the concern that we weren't being completely transparent by yep. um, not showing those entries. Okay. Okay. Um, so select board members, anything from any of you? Peter, Phil? Yes, Phil. Uh, I just, I wanted to ask Victor, and I think we touched on this last time, but my memory's a little hazy. As far as the, the 10,000 uh, that we took out of the budget, but we're then going to consider funding um, through uh, uh, our surplus, um, our fund balance, do we need that $10,000 as part of our anticipated paving coming up this spring or summer? We do not. Okay. You're muted. No, we don't. I believe we've got, the, I believe we've got that covered. Okay. Um, then my preference would be to not fund that 10,000 at all during this budget cycle, put the 5,000 in for the tennis court and take that out of the select board's discretionary fund, but then that would leave us with 3,000, Dorinda, in the discretionary fund? Okay. Yeah. Um, and I cannot support a reduction to 3%, and we'll vote against any budget that has reduced the COLA um, to that level. I think it's just totally inappropriate at this time. We're, we're trying to fund something on the back of our employees, and I won't support it. Okay. 
Okay. Um, I actually, I actually kind of like that myself to tell you the truth. Just, just take that $10,000 right out. That makes everything easier. Other board members. Uh, this is Liz. Just a, um, I probably should have asked this last meeting, but is there historically a line item that we don't spend because you're always, you know, talking about how we never really fully spend our budget um, or does it, is it completely random based on snowstorms and things like that? Is it generally out of the roads that doesn't get spent? Well, typically, Typically, it all comes out of the road budget one way or the other, because that's the gigantic variable. Mm. You know, most of the other stuff, there's not a lot of not a lot of give and take. So exactly where it comes out of in the in the road budget, yes, changes from time to time. But the fact of the matter is, as we go through the year, we carefully manage the total road budget, but we definitely move money around between the different line items from time to time when we have to. Can I so also I don't think ask? It's a, the, the, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to get clarity on what the first thing Phil said. Did you say to um, take out the 10,000 for the paving? What, what did you say about that? Yeah. Yeah. To just not fund it at all. Like give it 20. Yeah. Is that because we had 30, right? We were going to. Yeah. It's usually yeah. 30. Yeah. So give, give it 20. 20 and, yeah. and five take out what wait what about the tennis court take the five for the tennis court out of the select board discussionary fund and leave okay. like three grand in there so that keeps it at what dorinda already says we're just moving money around mm -hmm. oh no we're not no, no. we've taken ten thousand dollars out of the budget nine point no, we've, nine point we've taken we haven't take we won't change anything because we had already taken out um the five thousand from yeah from the um no what we've done is the the previous proposal was to was to uh fund that ten thousand dollars in a different way. Now we're removing the ten thousand dollars from the budget entirely. Mm. Oh, but that wasn't in the budget, though. The, the using the um, using our um, fund balance is not in the but doesn't show up in the budget, and that's what Dorinda's argument was. She wanted to be transparent to the voters. So, but the proposal that I was that I was discussing was that we were outlining moved money around to fund that ten thousand dollars without taking it out of the fund balance. Okay. I still think. Am I wrong way, about this, Dorinda? I think we just if if we if we adopt if we adopt Phil's suggestion to reduce that line item in the budget, then the only thing that we have to uh, rejiggle is how we pay for the tennis court, and the proposal is to take that out of the uh, select board account. Right. So and that brings us. What back that means to the is what that means is a budget reduction of $10,000. No, it doesn't. It, it puts us right back at 9.5. Where you were right. in the first, in the beginning. Where right. we were when we right, started right, right. the conversation. Right. So we've addressed item number one of the budget committee's concerns. Um, we need to decide what we're gonna do, uh, what we're gonna do on the COLA situation. And I, especially since we're now down to 9.5 again, um, I support just like I did the last time, the 4%, but I don't know how everybody else feels. Liz, Mary, what are you thinking? Uh, I don't think Mary's I'm here. sorry? Mary's not here, Peter. Oh, Mary isn't here either? No. Oh. No. Uh, okay. Victor had so his hand up. Okay, Victor. Um, I think uh, it's very good of Phil to uh, want to give the, uh, the employees the five percent. I I do wonder under what <clears throat> what we've already four percent four percent okay. Victor. Yeah, but 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 Phil said five. No four. You did say four. We've been at five, but we. 
compromised down to four last time. Okay. The only thing I'm yeah. wondering about, Peter, is uh, with the increased salaries we got and our overtime, uh, what's that going to do to our uh, uh, our uh, overtime but in the budget? What are they? What do we? What What do we budget to rent a 225 hours or something like that? I mean, how's that work? Or the we... overtime is 225 hours a year. So, so yes, it's essentially a it's a one. It's a one percent base increase. So I believe I'm right, Dorinda, when I say that that would be one and a half percent if it was overtime pay. Right. I think that Vic might be asking, which is a good question. In the line item for overtime, does that include this three percent, or is that like a fixed number? No. It, so in it's your all, calculations, Dorinda, it, it's all a calculation, so it automatically okay. formulates what two hundred and twenty-five hours would be at whatever percentage you guys say to use. Okay. So I am really, I am really sorry. We are doing this without two members of the of the board. Um, that's unfortunate. The, um, so I'm sorry, Dorinda. Can you tell us again? I'm sorry. I'm really confused now. What changes right. have been made? Could you tell us what you've done and where we are right now with the the current four percent? So where we are right now with 4%, and all I did was take, reduce this discretionary fund to $3,000 and eliminated the um, $10,000, which was already eliminated. The 10,000, we're only gonna fund $20,000 to the paving fund rather than adding an extra 10 from the fund balance. So all we really essentially did was move the tennis court money. Yeah. Um, and so it remains at, just as we started the whole conversation at 9.5, because we didn't change up to now, we have not changed any numbers. But hold on, the budget that you sent us, oh, that was with special articles, Never mind. Okay, so 9.5. And now if you were to... Um, Turn it to three percent. What does that look like? <clears throat> it would come down to nine point one six. And not worth it in my mind. So I would vote for a four percent. So here's the question. Our next select board meeting is two weeks from tonight, correct? Correct. I hate to have another long budget discussion, but I would really prefer that we approve the budget when at least four, if not five, of the board members are available. Absolutely. And the alternative, if we need to do it sooner, um, the alternative would be to have a special meeting when uh, Mary and Steve are available. And I don't know, is Mary still out west? Do we know? Yes, she's still out west, to my knowledge or information. Okay. And Steve's in Florida. He had a family thing come up. That's why he had to beg off at the last minute. But... Dorinda and Sarah, there's no reason why we can't approve the final budget in two weeks, is there? No. The um, the earliest you can warn the 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 meeting is I think um, the town meeting is I think the 19th or 20th of January. So you've got plenty of time. And if you're talking about maybe holding a special meeting to discuss what the legislature does on the sixth, uh, you might want to just do a budget meeting and um, on the 11th. I would assume people would be available. Well, let's 
let's try for that. Does that work for everybody? Yeah. And I mm-hmm. guess uh, I guess budget committee. The the only thing that we have not uh, yet agreed to with you is your recommendation that we reduce the cola to three percent. So that's still up in the air. But otherwise, we're good, right? Mark has a question. Think, so so folks, the the recommendation from the budget committee was was more not centered so much on the cola but was to try to get the budget increased below 90 percent and maybe from an optics point of view that's not something folks are that interested in doing but i think at least from my perspective our last meeting on the budget was pretty productive in pulling what about thirty thousand dollars out of this budget getting us down to 9.5 percent but i think the question we have to ask ourselves is have we done everything we can no. to limit this budget increase for the next year? And I'm, not, I'm just not 100% certain that we have. And so the attempt here was to find another 7,000 or so, which would bring us under 9%. So that we present to the bo- voters as, you know, as slashed an increase as possible to the budget. Can I um, ask also just a question of Dorinda? You won't be able to give me this answer right now, but I think it could be helpful. Would it be possible for us to find out how much gets put back into the fund balance at the end of each budget um, to give us a sense of what we're not spending? So what if it is 30,000 every year on average, right? It's not, what is it, 5,000, 10,000? Varies. We it varies, and we would have been overspent in the budget this year if we had not received two state payments at the end of June. One was seventy-two thousand, and the other one was um, forty some thousand, I believe, or thirty or forty some thousand. And they came in the last week of June. Otherwise, we would have been overspent. So that I think we added. Um, a little over, it was somewhere around $100,000, just in rough numbers, to the fund balance. The other thing that's coming out of this fund balance, which keeps seems to be keep slipping everybody's mind, is we all the money that we appropriated for these pay raises as of January 1 is coming out of the fund balance. So you're already reducing it by what we estimated to be. Um, So we are hacking away at that. And that is the only thing that keeps us going um, throughout the year, I have to say. It allows the four payments. It allows us to pay the school on time, which they don't care if we get the tax money or not. We still have to pay them that $800,000 every quarter. Right. Um, so, and we are not over every year. Um, you know, some years we are, some years we aren't. Um, <clears throat> a lot has yeah, to it do comes with... and, It comes and goes, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult to project. So, I, I mean, you know, we've got that, and we've got the, the issue of where the, uh, where the grand list is going to come out. Uh, we all saw the utilization report, which Sarah sent out to us. Mm-hmm. That would tend to indicate that the grand list is going up, but they're not exactly in lockstep the way they do that calculation. So, you know, Peter. and that's a and that's a tax issue, not a budget issue. Mm-hmm. Yes, Peter. I just want to say, just to clarify, that that uh, the, that CLA affects the education rate, which just affects the bottom line and the taxes. But you guys are going to be basing your tax rate on the 2022 grand list, right? You understand? Everybody understands that, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Victor has well, his hand up, Peter. I guess the budget committee, you, you guys are just saying you want to see the budget increase be no more than 8%. And now we're at, and now we're at 9.5 with what we've talked about tonight. Um, we're not going to finalize the budget tonight. I would suggest everybody, everybody think about this. Um, is there something else we can cut out of the budget? I don't know. I mean, there's always something we can cut out of the budget. I hate, I really hate to do it on the back of the town employees myself. Uh, but, you know, let's see what, uh, 
let's see what everybody has to say. And I would encourage the budget committee to to look for other ways to save the money rather than reducing the the COLA. And I would encourage the board members to look this over long and hard and, and Dorinda, you and Sarah the same way uh, and see if we at least can't find some of that money. I mean, I, I feel good. I feel pretty good that we're at, uh, we're at 9.5, but uh, you know, less is more or more is less as they say. So that makes sense to everyone. And I realize that means we need to have one more meeting and I'm sorry about that budget committee, but uh, it's likely the select board's going to have to have a uh, another uh, meeting to discuss the uh, town meeting situation. So at least it's a Zoom meeting. We're not asking you to drive across town. Uh, Mark has his hand up, Peter. Yep. Hi, P Hi Peter. I just want to clarify the budget committee's recommendation is to get the budget increase below 9%. Oh, below 9%. Okay. So we need, so we need a, half of, we right. now need half of 1%. Yes, be about $7,000. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. I'm sorry I screwed that up. I know that's what you said, I missed it. I apologize. Peter? Um, yeah. Peter? Um, yes. Just, Dorinda, what's, what's our uh, mowing uh, budget for uh, after July 1st next year? You already cut that in half. No, we didn't. Yes, you did. No, yes, we, didn't. we did. No, no we didn't. Yes, you did. Okay, so that's cut in half, but we're still going to get two mowings, is what I'm saying. We got a mowing in this budget before oh. July, and we got them after. So theoretically, oh. we're mowing one, one, once after uh, July 1st, then you could take, uh, I, think it, I think it's roughly $7,000. It right. is. It's on the you, money. Mm -hmm. you, you took already, you were at 14000 and you cut it down to 7000 well, But how much do we have left for this year from last year's budget? That doesn't, that doesn't, you mean what's in there right now? Yeah. I don't have a financial statement in front of me. I don't know. But that <laughs> doesn't, carry, that doesn't carry forward. It's whatever is used this year. That's and right. The rest we, that's correct, but we could mow. We could mow the last week in uh, in June and take care of it, like we did this year. We only mowed once year, but if you're not interested in doing it, uh, that's fine. Traditionally, when do they mow, Victor? Well, they usually mow like in uh, the in the month of June, and then uh, they come around in September, which, in my opinion, is not a big deal because, uh, I mean, last year they only mow. They didn't even mow once. And we got by with that. The idea behind the, the two mowings had to do with the spread of um, Bishop Sweet and the um, Chervil and stuff like that to try to get it to before it flowers. That was the original right. when we, we went to, to mow, two mowings. Yeah, we used to mow in July or sometime, you know, sometimes sort of the end of July when the rapid growing season was over. Yeah, but we changed it to June because of the Chervil, I believe. Right. And you're still going to, you're still going to mow in June. You're just not going to mow in July. Um, could so you Vic, refresh is, my memory about, about the gravel again, the $40,000 gravel line item? Wait is a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Can we just, can we just, can we just talk about the mowing thing and settle that first, Liz, if you don't mind? Yeah. So yeah. The, the, the problem, Victor, with what you're suggesting is we put no money in this year's budget We'll be okay because we've, we've got money for this year to mow in June, but we won't have any money the next year. That's correct. We'd have to put it off. We'd have to put the mowing oh, no. off until after July. No, is that, is that true? Is that true? No. Because well, well, oh. you, you'd, you'd be cutting it to zero. But you That's wouldn't be saying. able to mow next June. We can mow in June of 2022, but mm -hmm. we would have no money to mow in June of 2023. Right, but we could mow in July. We'd have to wait till July. Right. Right. I don't know. Is it not seven? Let's, let's look, look, look. We need, we've got a lot to do tonight. 
And uh, I think we understand what the issues are. We're, we're looking for $7,000. Um, it's got to be in there. It's got to be in there some way. And, uh, you know, believe me, the other way to, the other way to look at this is we just do $7,000 less road maintenance, but I hate to do that. I mean, we need the road maintenance, Uh but anyway, maybe we can take some out of some out of the, you know, what, what, what I'm trying to think about is we're going through this capital plan planning process and, you know, I doubt we're going to spend more than a very little bit of money, for instance, on on town hall and town garage maintenance until that process is completed. And we do have the issue of the heaters at the town garage, but maybe we can whack a couple of thousand dollars out of that and a couple of thousand dollars out of the town hall. And we're, you know, we're getting there. I'm just thinking without without sitting here looking over the numbers and thinking about it anymore, but I'm just thinking about places where we potentially have some flexibility and where potentially in the past sometimes we have not spent the money in that line item. So unless anybody objects, I'm going to conclude the budget discussion for tonight with the understanding that we may, depending on what the legislature does, we may need to have a special town meeting uh, probably on the 11th, not town meeting, select board meeting, or uh, we'll finalize the budget at our next regular select board meeting. Can I ask like Michael Everybody with that? I just have a uh-huh. quick question on Vector on the mowing. Is it $7,000 every time they mow? Roughly. Okay. That's a lot. Michael Levine looks like he has a question. Yeah, I, I just wanted okay, to... Hi, Michael. Hi. Um, last year when you went from two mowings to one mowing, I did ask that question about why, and I know that you were caught flat and desperate to get somebody to just mow once last year, but I was also kind of assured that you had no intention of cutting to just one mowing. The two mowing is really important for keeping the noxious weeds down. So just keep that in mind when you do finalize the budget. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with that, we're going to conclude the uh, the budget discussion for tonight, and thank you, budget committee. And uh, move ahead with the treasurer's report, Dorinda. Thank I you, don't Peter. have any, I don't have anything. Okay. Someone else. Someone else spoke up. Okay. Mm-mm. Considering amending the town's personnel policy to address employee sick time due to COVID action possible. So I believe what we had was a proposed change, and I don't have the language in front of me, but the proposed change essentially said that we were going to allow employees to go in the hole in their sick time uh, for COVID related absences. Yeah, that was my Final. recollection. But only for COVID. Really. And the question and the question we had, I believe, was if we were going to limit, limit that to some finite amount of time, like the amount of time before our disability kicked in, and we were going to look into uh, the disability question, and I'm not sure whether we did or not. I kind um, of forgot about it myself. I apologize. <coughs> I don't think being sick with COVID would fall under the Disability Act, to be honest with you. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know how Why that's going out, to be honest with you. I would, I mean, and I don't know the answer either, but I would presume it's like any other illness. I don't it's a, know. It's a it's a it's a sickness. So I mean that's that's well, another question, I guess maybe. I think that what we were sort of the idea behind this conversation um was to talk about 
uh, the if well, there could be two things. One is someone gets sick from COVID. Excuse me. And I have an emergency here at home, so I'm backing out. Okay. I'm sorry. Who's um, that? That was Bill. Bill, he's leaving. Okay, Bill. Thank you. So I think there were two sort of scenarios. One is that um, someone gets sick with COVID and we automatically sort of give them sick days to use for COVID um, or someone is sick with COVID and doesn't have sick days because they've used them all up and we grant them paid sick leave for X number of days. I mean, my recommendation would be up to five days because that's sort of now where the CDC is like, stay home for five days. Um, and that would be either one of two scenarios. One, they've used up all their sick time for other reasons, or two, everybody gets that sort of granted to them, which is an expense. Like I wouldn't, I don't think I would vote for that. I don't think I'd vote for anyone because there could be people out there who have, you know, 10 weeks of sick time right now available to them. Um, if they've worked no, here a long time, so. and don't use but, your sick time. No, we need to, the, we, we, we definitely, and that was the concern. We definitely need to limit we definitely need to put a limit on it if we're going to extend it. And the question was that I guess we still don't know the answer to. And, and Dorinda's brought up another question, uh, which is, is, is COVID related illness going to count towards the waiting period for, uh, for disability? And uh, the other thing which complicates that is, you know, you can have multiple, the way the disability works it's a it's a waiting period per occurrence. It isn't a waiting period per year. So, you know, if somebody had some reason to be out on disability and then they wanted to file for disability for COVID, you know, they would have another uh, another waiting period, which complicates the issue even more. I mean, I don't think that that's the conversation that we should have tonight about whether or not I think it's because it takes months to get to qualify for disability. And so we're really talking about road crew being sick, can't work for three or four days because they have COVID and they have no sick time. Like, are we going to grant them um, and, and have them put it in the hole, like, and that they earn it back? Are we just mm -hmm. gonna give them X number of days free? Probably not. So that, I think that's what our discussion is. And Andy the other thing we have to first. think about is, which has already come up, what about dependents? I think so if somebody same. has to take somebody has to take time off to pay for their son, daughter, spouse, parent, whoever it is, that list of eligible people. Um, does this apply to that as well? I would say it would have to, right? I think so. Yeah, Randy had a comment first, uh, P Peter. I'm, I don't mean to take control but can you not see that people are raising their hands i need to ask you no that. i can't no i can't i'm on the i'm on the phone list so i have no way of knowing if people are raising their hands so, okay so yes, if you don't mind me, I'll, if i see it so randy you, no. you said something so uh peter just kind of hit on what i was gonna uh ask about was is this does this pertain just to the employee or does it fall out to you know uh their dependents or other family members if they have to provide care. And the other, the other thing is um, uh, just, are, are you talking about a, a per occurrence event or an annual limitation? Is it five days? If you're talking about five days, is it five days annually or five days per occurrence? Um, just thoughts that jump into my head as you start talking about this because it mm -hmm. means dramatically different things. Well, and you could have, I mean, suppose you have two kids and one kid gets sick, then the other gets sick, then you get sick. What happens? Does that mean it's 15 days? Dorinda. Um, for the record, with the last bout of COVID, we had an employee that we did go into the hole by nine days. And that probably would have been 10 days um, except it fell over a holiday. So 
um, they got paid for the holiday and as part of that week. So, um, and then the rest was the other four days was sick time that they did go in the hole. But when all was said and done, they were 70 hours, I think, in the hole. <laughs> so we've already done that. Okay. With the first. And at that time, at that time, 10 days was the CDC guidance. That's correct. It isn't anymore, but it was then. Yeah. My recommendation is would be that we allow people to go into the hole by five days. I mean, that's just, I mean, right now it's looking like the virus, if you get the Omicron, it's not as severe and the CDC is saying you can go back after five days. Um, so the only problem, the only problem with that, Liz, is that I'm just hearkening back to a lot of my relatively unpleasant discussions with the road crew. The first thing they're going to say is, or somebody's going to say is, so he got nine days and now you're cutting us back to five days. How's that fair? Well, I don't think he did. I think he used his own sick time and he went in the hole four days. Is that right, Dorinda? He went in the whole nine days. Well, in the yeah, hole is still what you owe. <laughs> I mean, you're, he, he's not making any money off this. He's he, any sick day he earns is just being put back into his negative. Right. right. That's right. So every week right. that after every week after this happened, he accrued back his sick time, which kept reducing it and reducing it. Right. I mean, maybe we can go back and I mean, maybe it's a case by case, you know, that we deal with it as it happens, but allow them to, you know, maybe we just make the statement, you can go into the negative if you don't have sick time and the number of days will be at the discretion of your supervisor. It's all going to be different. I think we need to. I think we need to. I think we need to limit it because there are just too many. There are too many different situations, and and the other thing, and I thank God it isn't the town of Middlesex, but another organization I'm involved with. We have a person who is saying that they've undergone so much stress. They want. They're putting in a disability claim, and they think they're going to be out for ninety days. So, you know, it isn't just recovering from the illness of COVID. It's the whole. Yeah. Randy has a comment. So uh, my head goes to, um, you know, are we are we paying on a weekly basis as a biweekly basis? Are the employees two weeks behind? If if somebody was to take a bunch of time, um, and the town has that li liability, um, when you start thinking about thresholds and whatnot, does does the town require, you know? Uh, a payment out of their last payroll um, to bring them back to nothing. And if that's the case, then, then ultimately, um, you know, that threshold should never be more than what their last payroll would be. But I don't know the answer to that question, Dorinda. Do we... Yeah. Yes, it's in the personnel policy that if they are negative, that it will be deducted from their last paycheck. Yep. So there you go, Randy. And, um, so I do think, and I to back to what Liz was saying, I think you need to be consistent. We can't decide on a case by case basis. These payrolls should show up on Monday morning. We have to process payroll. We can't be tracking down what we're going to allow and what we're not going to allow. And it needs to be fair across the board because truly it isn't just the highway crew. You also have two people in the town hall that have been sick this week. And um, so if it is COVID related, it also affects them as well. So um, this isn't just road crew. Right. So Randy asked, have they paid every two weeks, Dorinda? Is it an every two week paycheck? So it's 80 yeah. hours. Right. They can't go into the hole more than 80 hours. I would not say not. I would say, especially since we've already done it for one person four days and it could have been nine. I don't know. I don't know. What is it? Uh, let's make a decision on this. Well, it's, it I'm sounds like it already exists if it says that. This, we don't need to make a decision. 
Well, no, well, we didn't, because you're saying you're saying he had he had six days he could he could use. Now the question is though, didn't. he used up all those days. So let's say he's sick again. If we say he could use ten days for COVID, that that essentially reinstates his sick time, so he has some sick time. Yeah, I would almost say you can't be in the hole more than ten days at any time. Right. Right. And, and, right. Yes. So it could be that he uses that twice, but builds it up over you know the next six months, and it happens in the same calendar right. year, same fiscal year. Right. How about but making a motion, Liz? <laughs> it, it, should, has something it, to say. Should, it should say COVID only, COVID related only. And, yes. and I think you need to clarify if this qualifies under family members or I, I think you need to yes. be very clear in this. I would say it does well, because we use our sick time for COVID for our family members. Okay. I mean, I would. If I needed to stay home with a child, I would no, use my I think sick it has time. To, no, no, no. I think I think by federal law it has to as we discussed yeah. before but we I will think... allow any employee to go in the hole i'm stating your motion for you liz yeah uh up to 10 days for covid related illnesses for themselves or their uh legal dependents whatever the right word is but do we need to clarify that it's I think it, we should clarify it as something like they may go no more than um, 10 days in the negative for COVID related, as opposed to, because it makes it well, sound like it's in a row. Well, like in, they the can negative, take 10 days in the off. negative is better than saying in the hole. I agree, but it's the same. No, but concept. I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to turn it around. What are you saying, Randy? Suggest using an hourly rate for an eighty-hour limit. If yeah. you use day, if you use days, especially with these guys using you know ten days of uh, or ten-hour work days in the summer, yeah. Um, yeah. I just would want to make sure that there's absolutely no confusion that you're basing this off from an eight-hour workday. So I would suggest using an hours figure instead of days. Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. Okay, Liz, um, we're ready so for the So employees, um, uh, you know, may, um, may have up to uh, 80 hours uh, negative, however we say that. Deficit? Yeah, deficit. 80-hour deficit, um, up to 80-hour deficit at any given time um, due to COVID-related yeah. illness. We don't or need to say anything about dependent. them or their family. And do we, Wait. is this for, is this going to be a forever thing or are we going to do it for six mm -hmm. months or a year or? During the pandemic, just say. Yeah, but who's going to say when the pandemic is over? Chris but has something you, to say. Chris McVeigh. Why, why don't you just renew it every six months? Um, because that should give you enough leeway. Yeah. If you think that's too long, then every three months and just. You know, the other thing I would suggest is that in terms of dependents and things like that, just let it track the family with the Family Medical Leave Act, um, because that's a known thing that we already have to follow. Um, so you, you're not just for taking care of dependents or spouses or things like that. Just let it track the uh, FMLA. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Can I, so my let's, question let's is, do why it. do we need let's, to do this when we allow this already? We say in our personnel file that they need anything that's in the negative, they need to repay. Does it not? We already allow people to go into the negative, it sounds like, and we pay them. Is that true? We have the in the past. The reason this came we probably up. Will it the reason this came up was because somebody who was already in the negative from COVID went and submitted sick hours, just regular sick hours that were not based on COVID. They were just out. And they said they were told they could use, go in the negative for any sick hours. Oh. And that's what came up, that there was 
to be a clarification as to the COVID, what is, what's justified to go into the negative amount. And it was determined it was gonna be for COVID only. Right. So what, again, and again, I, I think we're making this more complicated than yeah. it needs to be. But let's say, let's say somebody uses five days, 40 hours, for COVID and they're now at zero. They've used up all their sick time. Then five months later, they've granted they've accrued some of it back, but let's ignore that for the moment. Five months later, they're sick again in some way. So they've used five days for COVID. So as much as it's a normal sickness, which is causing them to go in the hole, they wouldn't be in the hole without the COVID. No, not necessarily. So they would be able to use those sick days, is what I'm saying, the way I not, look at it. Not necessarily. I mean, they can use well, vacation time if they're sick. They can use personal time if they're no, sick. No, no, no. I understand. No, no, no. I understand. But if they say, if they say, so let's say, let's say they, they zero out their sick time with, and I realize you know, they're going to be all kinds of, you know, so many days of this and so many days of that. But let's say they zero out their sick time um, and they've used five days for COVID, okay? And their sick time is zero. Now it's four months later and now they're sick. They would not be going in the hole for the current sickness if they haven't had the five COVID days. So does that mean they can go in the hole up to 80 hours for the current sickness? I think it does. That's going to be really hard to manage. You're yep. going to have to track that separately. No, Every time I think you just say, sick, I think the way you manage it is you just say, look, you're allowed to go in the hole for up to 80 hours for COVID sick time expenses. And stand up. I think that covers it. Did you just make a separate COVID bank of five or 10 days, whatever you have? And um, when someone gets COVID, they access that bank without going through their regular sick time to begin with? Because I think Peter makes a really good point of, you know, if someone goes out and uses all their sick time for COVID and then has another sickness that they would have been covered for had it not been for COVID, uh, they, there can be a built-in inequity there. Um, but if you have a separate COVID sick bank, that each employee gets however many days you decide and they're out for COVID, they're just accessing that, uh, going into the hole and, and reserving their other sick time. We don't have I, a budget for that. We, one, we don't have a budget, but also- and You're getting paid it, back off, it, the, it, off the COVID, it's, right? It's their accrued time that's working them back out of the hole. So they would, right. if you keep that accrued time separate, you're never going to pull them out of the hole because they got nothing applying against it. Yeah. Well, and what you have to, what you'd have to do is, if you if you set up that COVID sick time as a separate thing, we'd have to set up a whole other account in our payroll system to track the COVID time. But how? I do think you pay I think back? we keep it simple. I say I say you can go you can go in the hole for the next six months. And maybe longer, but for the next six months till July 1st, you're allowed to go in the hole up to 80 hours for COVID-related sickness and leave it at that. May I say something? And just on, yes. Yeah. Okay. I just want to I just want to try to get this motion down because we are supposed to have a public hearing pretty soon. So should the motion be to allow employees to borrow? Can we use that word borrow? I just can't stand going into the hole. Can we borrow up to eight hours of sick time only if the illness affecting them and and or their family is related to COVID? This policy will be reviewed in six months. I think borrow. I think borrow was the wrong word. I think I think um, uh, go go negative on their accrued sick time or something Ugh. like that is going to make more. Fence, but I'll leave it up to you, Sarah, to craft the craft the uh, language. And I'll move that. I'll move that motion. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 
So that's three eyes, and we have two absent. So we have uh, we have approved that, and we need to uh, include that in our personnel policy effective immediately. And do we say to cover the situation that already exists that we're doing this retroactive to I don't know when retroactive to whenever that first situation came up? Well, it already happened. There was nothing. They were paid. They got. They were covered. It, nobody denied them any pay. Yeah, but how are we going to? Okay, let's just let's just keep it simple and do it. And Sarah, just we're, add we're, that we're we'll be too far into the, in We're getting months. too far into the weeds. No. Okay. Done and done. Thank you. So we have a public hearing warned for six o'clock and it's now six ten. Um do we have any additional people other than the ones I'm aware of already who are participating in the hearing? Uh, yeah. people in the waiting room, Sarah? Uh well they're they're in the meeting now. Um, but we have members of the planning commission, including Sandy and Phil Coleman and uh let's see, Theo Kennedy. And we have uh, Paul Zabriski is here, and JJ Vandette is here. And am I missing anybody, Liz? Lowry. Lowry is here. So um, <laughs> this is just such a nightmare for me to try. And I, I, rec I recognize most of the familiar names, but the others I don't recognize. And I sure can't see any raised hands. So uh, either Liz or Phil, if, if you would conduct conduct a public hearing and recognize people, that would be great. Sure, I can do that. One of you willing to do that? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, thank you, Liz. So at this time, uh, at this time, we're gonna open up the public hearing on the Energy Town Plan. And Sandy, let and me- we're ready to receive comments, questions, whatever. Sandy. Um, this is Sandy Levine, and I just wanted to provide a brief introduction and um, thank the select board for getting this on, on the schedule. This is uh, an enhanced energy plan. It's an addition to the town plan. It would be an amendment to the town plan. It is based on the state's comprehensive energy plan and how that would be applied to Middlesex. Um, it's a project that the Planning Commission has worked on for two years and has unanimously voted in favor of twice. And we would encourage the select board um, to pass this on so it can be voted on hopefully by town meeting and recommend that the vote be to make that both the town plan and the energy plan valid for eight years. Thank you very much. And I think Theo may have some additional comments as well. Theo? Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to briefly the select board. Um, yes, we're asking for your support. Uh, again, uh, Sandy said, our chair, that we unanimously voted in support of it. Uh, I, just a couple quick observations. Um, I wouldn't want the goal for perfection to be the enemy of the good. Uh, we work carefully with the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, but we also try to make this uh, Middlesex size, as it were, uh, but there have been observations that I want to quickly address. One around data. It is definitely true that a lot of the data that this relies upon just doesn't exist specific to Middlesex. So uh, if you look at the, the document on page three, it speaks directly to the data sources that were used. There are no inaccurate data. It's the best available data. And certainly as we go forward, we're gonna to want to, whenever possible, have Middlesex specific data. The other thing I would mention is there's nothing in this uh, document that is a requirement. Um, reasonable minds might think something should be requirements, but there, these aren't requirements. This is a template uh, to deal with a way at the municipal level to participate in our share of the goal of, uh, of moving to renewable energy sources uh, by 2050 to the degree of 90%. I also wanted to say that this isn't an endpoint. This is really just a starting point. And a, a town plan is a living document. Uh, we worked hard to understand both the legal and factual context 
Um, I think this is an opportunity for the town uh, to uh, participate at the local level uh, in, in priorities that are both regional, statewide, and national, if not international. Um, um, we did we did listen carefully in our public hearing to several commenters uh, and, and did make adjustments that I think improve the plan uh, and they're reflected in the text. Uh, and I also wanted to um, emphasize that there was attention to making sure that we're not disenfranchising anyone by this. So, so there was language, a uh, general language I, I recognize, but on page six to specifically um, identify that it's our goal to in implement this in a way that is uh, financially and culturally equitable. Um, I think those are the highlights. Uh, we, 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 we are under a little bit of a timeline crunch in, in so much as that in order for this to go to the voters, which we're asking that you please pass it and send it to the voters in March, um, that if you are to make any amendments, we wouldn't be able to meet that timeline. I, I guess there's some situation where if you did need to make substantive changes, that it could go before the voters in November, but we're hoping that you will uh, approve it and, uh, and send it on to the voters in March. Thank you. Other comments? Paul Zabritsky. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, and thank you for taking the opportunity to consider this. Uh, I wanna thank the Planning Commission for the work that they've done uh, to really bring this forward. Um, having been involved in the early days of, of Act 46 and how, how this process moved forward and, and seeing recently in uh, with the, the release of the Comprehensive Energy Plan and the, the, uh, the blueprint put forward by through the process of the Global Warming Solutions Act, noting that the administration's uh, comments on the, those plans uh, both stated, they rejected the idea that there be statewide planning around energy uh, and, and its relationship to zoning and, and town use and really putting the onus on local communities uh, to engage in this process. So I think there's been a lot of great work done. Um, it's not perfect. It, 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 none of these ever are. There's no crystal balls as to what are the technologies that are uh, going to be the solution 10 years from now. Uh, so I do expect it will continue to evolve, but I think it's really important that we get this template move forward, um, both for uh, being able to be, have the town be respected in the processes that our, the regulatory bodies go through as they try and move forward on energy uh, infrastructure. Um, and also just as a, as a community member engaging in a process, um, it's, it, you wanna feel like you're not just chasing your tail and that, that these processes actually do move forward. And so uh, love to see the select board put this to the voters and, and have a public debate uh, and a vote on that. So appreciate very much your time um, and look forward to working on energy projects uh, in Middlesex in the future. Thanks. Chris, you had a comment Thank and then Lowry. Um, I did. Um, I was, well, first of all, thank you very much for preparing uh, this energy plan, which is very comprehensive and informative. Um, it was interesting to see um, all the different um, types of heating and, and transportation uh, that the plan covers. Um, I, I think it's an aspirational document. Um, I would be one of the ones um, um, who would want to see requirements as opposed to aspiration at this point, just because of the um, climate changes that we are dealing with. Um, but I think this is a, a really good first step. I fully support it. Uh, and I would ask the uh, select board to think about incentivizing residents to go solar, uh, much the way we do um, during town meeting to reduce our tax bill, I think by 1% or something like that, if it's paid all at once, that type of uh, incentive for community members to just go the next step. Um, but I fully support this plan and um, um, look forward to the debate. Thank you. Lowry. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you also to the Planning Commission for preparing this. 
it, it is quite a piece of work. Um, and it, and it does bring a whole bunch of, you know, uh, concrete ideas and um, options for the town to consider where, you know, prior to having it, it was really up to just individuals to come up with, you know, brainstorming ideas. And so it's really helpful to have this. Um, and I agree, it's not, it's not a slam dunk, but it's a great start. I've spoken to um, the uh, energy coordinator in the town of Waterbury, where they adopted an enhanced energy plan a, a couple of years ago. And they've been using theirs in this way, where they've got uh, a large committee made up of, of select board members and other volunteers, and they're working, chipping away at the at the proposals in their enhanced energy plan. And um, and so it's a guiding document for that uh, committee. And so I think we can do a lot of good here as well, um, working together, not just as a volunteer energy committee, but getting the, the uh, select board and the planning commission together on this as well. So look forward to that. Uh, JJ. Hello, everybody. Uh, JJ Van Det. I appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, in favor of this plan, and I hope the select board will will approve it. I had the opportunity to review it in full uh, in October, and it is there's clear to me that there's a lot of work that has gone into this document. Um, in during one of the public feedback sessions, a uh, few suggestions were made and edits were suggested along the way. Uh, I had some comments and feedback that have since been incorporated in the plan, which was awesome to see. Um, yeah, I, 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 the words were kind of taken out of my mouth here in the comments prior to this. Uh, it, it is an aspirational document, which is great. Um, it doesn't obligate us to anything, um, but it, it, it sets some guideposts for us uh, as a town, which is awesome. And just to echo something that I think Paul said, you know, the what's in there right now um, is not necessarily going to be the path forward go, going forward. Uh, technology is changing fast. Um, energy use patterns are changing rapidly by the day. So uh, it's it, this is it, it seemed to me like good enough for now, uh, a good step in the right direction, knowing that it will, you know, things will evolve over time. But um, I appreciate you considering this and uh, I'd love to see it in front of the the folks in Middlesex to, to vote on and ratify uh, come town meeting day. Thank you. Okay. Any other people who are here on the call that would like to make comments? I don't see anyone. Sandy, did you have any sort of final comments? No, okay. I do have one question, Liz, Peter. Yeah. Um, Sandy, when we heard from uh, from Dexter at our uh, at the previous uh, at the previous hearing, um, he mentioned that uh, the state has, I guess, just in the last month, adopted a new comprehensive, updated comprehensive energy plan, and that this is that this document is based on the on the old comprehensive energy plan and i'm not familiar with either of those documents but he was uh advocating for using the data and uh, and the goals and objectives and whatever was in that was in the new state's comprehensive energy plan and i have no idea how much work that would be and what the effect of it would be and if it's even even possible so that's, I... that's kind of a question oh it looks it looks like Paul can address that. Well, I, um, so uh, those plans are constantly evolving. Uh, and uh, certainly the Global Warming Solutions Act, uh, its plan will be hotly debated in the legislature as they go to allocate resources uh, to move forward with various facets of it. So I, I think we're in a constantly evolving environment uh, related to both the data available. And I think that the way the plan was written, it, it assumes that we're constantly trying to use the best available information uh, in decision-making. 
So I, I think that uh, I, I guess I'll speak to my sense of urgency, which is, is you know, <laughs> we have a planet that uh, is in peril. Um, every day that we don't act is a win for the fossil fuel industry and a loss for our children. And uh, we could sit here and debate and try and make perfect uh, all these documents and they're out of date the next day. So I, I don't think that we can really stop and, and try and assemble all of this and, and just make it so uh, for today because it will be out of date tomorrow. Yep. Okay. I did, Thank just, you. I did just look it up, and the the co new comprehensive energy plan is due out sometime in 2022. It's what the the Middlesex plan is based on the current comprehensive energy plan, and there's nothing stopping the town of Middlesex from updating if we need to, based on new data that would come out in 2022 or after. Yep. Yeah, that was actually okay, my question, you. Sandy. Um, was that, you know, so you're asking us to um, approve it for the next eight years. Uh, and so this energy plan is within the town plan. They're not two separate documents, right? It's one thing, the town plan that has this energy. Um, so is there anything from stopping us from um, making changes to the energy plan within like four years, or does that become the whole thing is, you're, you're doing the whole, you're basically doing the whole thing. It, the adoption process is the same, whether you're changing the town plan or the energy plan. So it would go through the same adoption process, but there's nothing stopping the town from updating this in four years, two years, one year. I see. Okay. But it's the adoption of it. Yes. Okay. But you wouldn't, if, if you updated it, would you need to re-adopt it? Yes. Okay. All right. Theo. No, I, I just wanted to add that um, the opportunity for this uh, energy plan uh, started in a 2016 law, which um, if we adopted this, it could give us, among other things, uh, deference and, uh, at the Public Utilities Commission when it comes to questions of renewable energy siting. But the, but the plan that we're presenting doesn't just focus on that. That's one of the elements. The, the four areas that it focuses on are consistent with the Global Warming Solutions Act. And the areas are conservation and efficient energy use, reducing transportation demand, looking at patterns and density of land use and the siting of renewable energy generation. So th those elements are in the current plan, uh, uh, the Global Solar Solutions Act. And I, I don't see any, I, I, I wanna just echo that this is an organic document in so much as we would have to formally readopt it, but there's nothing stopping us from making amendments uh, as, we, as technologies change and as we make decisions as a community. Are there other comments? Scudder joined us. Um, this is Scudder, just sorry, running an errand, um, got in late, but um, I've looked, I've read it and it looks good to me, um, thoughtful, some helpful information. You know, you always want stuff that's more current than, you know, what they had to work with, but I think it's great. I think it's the right thing to do and gives good guidance to the town. And, you know, it has some interesting information, like we can get plenty of solar if we just do a good job um, on, the, on that with that. I think that we can actually help other communities rather than just meet our own targets. Hey, Liz. Liz. Yes, sir. I just think we ought to uh, enter Elliot Berg's uh, email to the board into the record. Okay. Can you read it? Nope. Uh, dear members of the select board, we would like to weigh in strongly in favor of the proposed Middlesex Energy Enhanced Energy Plan that you will be considering tonight. We think that it is no exaggeration to say that climate change, a major focus of the plan, is the paramount public issue of our time and the most serious challenge to the quality of life for our children and grandchildren. In response to climate change, action will be needed at all levels of society, including the local. The plan's main action items, conservation and efficient use of energy, encouraging reduced single occupancy vehicle trips, 
and the use of renewable sources for transportation, adopting patterns and densities of land use to increase energy conservation and effective siting renewable energy generation all address climate change in our own community. We applaud the work that went into crafting the Enhanced Energy Plan and urge the Select Board to throw its full support behind the plan. Thank you for your consideration, Elliot Berg and August Burns. Thanks. Yeah. Any other comments? Uh, someone is just joining us by the name of Shane. Oh, hi, Shane. <laughs> Shane is our road crew guy. <laughs> your, your road foreman. Our road foreman. Um, anyone else? I am looking for any more raised hands for discussion of the enhanced energy plan. Okay. I don't think there's any further discussion, Peter. Okay. So just again, to review the process, uh, at our next board meeting, um, the select board will need to make a decision about whether we we uh, move this forward and put it on the uh, agenda for town meeting, correct? Sarah? Oh, um, I didn't know who you're addressing that to. Yes, and Sandy, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have, even if the board meets at its regular, votes on this at its regular meeting and votes to accept uh, placing this question of the enhanced energy plan on the ballot for the March 1st, 2022 town meeting by its January 18th meeting, I believe according to Theo's, Handy dandy uh, adoption timeline, we are safe, right? Yep. Sandy nodded. I, I believe so, but um, you know, you should double double check the adoption requirements, but I think that's within the timeline. Well, it's gonna be the same as for town meeting, for a town yep. meeting and passing a warning, so it's the same deal. Yep. Okay then. So Thanks. that concludes our, uh, or that will conclude our, our public hearing on the town energy plan. Thank you all for your, uh, for your comments and your, your participation. Um, Sandy, I guess you were on, up for a uh, planning commission update and you sent us that uh, document. Yes, um, thank you. And uh, thank you for your time. I sent you an updated document that lists that identifies the projects the Planning Commission is working on and the current status of those. Happy to answer any questions that you have. I know you have a very full meeting and we um, have other things to need to get to. I did want to make sure that the select board knows that we're moving forward um, quickly with uh, the update of, of zoning. Um, I had hoped that it would be done by the end of the year. It looks like it'll be done in you know, middle of, uh, you know, probably by March or so, but where the plan is to do some outreach in the spring and the summer and have it be ready with the process to be voted on <laughs> in November. And um, the other, other update is the, on the Route 2 and uh, scoping study the route, route two improvements for bicycles and pedestrians and the study that's going into that. That's also moving along <laughs> and we have a, um, a, a public meeting uh, community forum on that uh, in February at our February meeting. We'll be reviewing drafts in, in January. <laughs> Were you, um, so I'd been in touch with um, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, um, Chris, uh, Christian Meyer that we've been working with on the, um, the capital spending plan. And um, I'm, I'd have him look at some possible like planning grants for us to consider for um, the, like doing a study, like a scoping study of the town hall. Were you planning on applying for any like planning grants in in this next year? We haven't planned on it. You know, it's out there as a possibility. And obviously we should have a conversation. What's the town's biggest need? I don't know now that there is a need um, for it, but um, we, we could consider it. It certainly if there were other things that, uh, that that obviously would be fine, but we right. could talk about we could talk about that. Um, I just, as, as a way of an update, I also noted that I believe there will be two openings on the planning commission. Um, both Elias Gardner and Philip Coleman have said they do not plan to run 
for the next term. Um, I have spoken with some community members and I believe there will be names on the ballot and folks who are will be stepping up to, to serve on the planning commission. Any questions for Sandy? Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. I do appreciate I do appreciate your uh, document. It's very helpful in terms of keeping track of all the different pieces and parts of what's going on. Very and helpful. If, Thank you. And if anyone ever has any questions, feel free to reach out or give me a call or send me an email. Yep. Okay, next on the agenda is reviewing the trail committee work plan. And Michael Levine was supposed to be here. Every... What, you don't see me? <laughs> oh, I don't see you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we'll play okay, Michael, here. you're on. Um, well, I don't really have a lot of introduction. I sent you the work plan uh, that we, the Trails Committee, let me, let me like step back. Trails Committee is a subcommittee of the Conservation Commission. And we don't have elected or appointed members. It's anybody who's interested in trail development around Middlesex can come to meetings and can participate. So we first go through the Conservation Commission. We developed this work plan for, I'd say, the next six months to a year that I shared with the select board. And essentially, we are going to try and promote the use of some of the existing town corridors, public right-of-ways. And those, we had walked them all this summer and kind of evaluated them for their potential. And we decided that there are three that we would start with to start small. One is uh, Davy Road, one is Upper Lower Barnett, and the third one is the section between East Bear Swamp and North Bear Swamp, because a lot of people like to walk or yeah. bicycle that entire loop. So the next, the reason we're coming to the select board is just so you'd have a chance to see what the committee is up to, what our plan is. And we'd like just, you know, uh, some, I'm certainly happy to answer questions, but basically we'd like the select board to endorse this plan as did the conservation commission so that we can go to the next step, which is try and develop um, a little better idea of, you know, these, these are existing right of ways. They're walkable right now, but what might we want to do? We could develop um, some budget ideas, but mostly we want to put up some signage so people around town can actually find these trails that exist on the map but most of them, when we got to them, we didn't even know how to start walking on them because there was either a few shrubs or they were overgrown or whatever. So that's really what we're looking for is just like uh, an endorsement. This sounds great. Go ahead. One of the things we certainly would do is try and communicate with any of the neighbors of these trailheads. So if they do see an uptick in activity, um, they would understand what what's going on. We would be careful not to be out of the town right of way if we do put up any signage. And we certainly wouldn't be doing any work until we came back to the select board and said, here is a suggested work plan. What do you think about that? We would work uh, hopefully with the town uh, road crew if there was anything that was going on that they might be able to help with, those kinds of things. So we really wanna be kind of step-by-step um, -step start slow. The idea is just to let people know these are assets around town. There's a lot more need for recreation right now. And you don't have to go that far to find a nice trail to walk in the woods. Thank you. Any, uh, any questions for Michael? So, uh, what Michael is looking for is a select board endorsement of their work plan. And somebody willing to uh, make that motion? Hold on, Peter? Dick had a question. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Um, 
that work plan, uh, Michael, you sent to the select board? Uh, yes. It's also... Is that on? Go ahead. Yeah, it is, it is available online on a Google sheet. And I think, Vic, it's the, pretty much the same one that you had seen when you were in on our trails committee meeting uh, and we were talking about the work plan. It hasn't changed much, but it's still definitely available as a Google sheet. I can send you, actually, I, can, well, I don't know if I can figure out how to put the link in here, but I can send it so that you can have it there. Yeah, it should go to... Uh... I would think it would be of interest to uh, both uh, Shane and I. Uh, I know that, uh, and I don't know if, is he part of your trails uh, committee? I had a discussion about a week ago with uh, the Dennis Nealon, Dennis and Mary Nealon. Mary is very active on the committee. Okay. And they were, uh, they were asking to, uh, to, Put material in uh, over there, so uh, it sounded like uh, there was some work that uh, they were, or the trail committee would want the the uh, town crew to do, and uh, I don't know if they expect that to be done this year or not, but we would have to budget that. Would that be correct, Dorinda? Um, so, so maybe, um, so maybe sooner than later, if uh, you expect anything done this year, we should have a, a figure, or it would be, uh, next, it would be. Yeah, budget. I, I, I understand what you're saying, and you know, if they can develop, what we did is divide. Um, basically sort of members of the committee have adopted one of these three trails, and Mary has adopted that section. If Correct. she can develop a plan and a budget that quickly, I'll definitely try and get some numbers to you. But I, I feel like we're probably a little bit behind the curve of getting it in the budget that's going to be voted on next week. Right. I mean, I mean, I, I just want to caution because you've seen here, well, I don't know if you've been here all night, they keep, uh, our budget, our highway budget keeps getting cut in, uh, in our, uh, our uh, duties get extended. So at some point, uh, <laughs> a little thin. So no, I just, I'm just putting that out there. That's all. Yeah. And Mary may have, Mary. No, may that's have, a good point, Victor. It, it is a good point. And Mary may have been sort of more inquiring as she starts to develop a plan for that trail, just like other people are going to develop the six. But I don't think any of us expect something to happen in the next month or anything like that. This is a longer term process. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Miranda. Um, if this is a subcommittee of the conservation committee, this may come out of their funds, which they allocate money for special projects every year. Right, exactly. And that's why we want to be um, sort of procedural and develop the budget. Conservation Commission has said that there may be available certainly money for signage. You know, when we start getting into heavier equipment and gravel, that, that's a whole different realm. But for signage and things like that, they said they definitely would have money to cover this. Because they, they see this, you know, essentially the Conservation Commission sees this as an extension of their limited uh, pool of resources to do the work they want to do. But the fact that this second group came along and is willing to kind of spread that out a little, they're definitely willing to support it. I have a question in general about the trails. Someone had reached out to me about who to get in contact with and I gave them uh, Mitch's information, but I said if he didn't get back to them that I would find someone else. Eight, so is there someone that you we would you would recommend that if someone was interested that they could reach out, to, like do you have a little sub chair or something like that? Yeah, Adrian, Megita and I are kind of co-chairing the committee. Okay. So either of us is fine. All right, I'll just let this woman know. Her name is Elizabeth, I believe. And um, if this information about the contact is not currently on the town website, we can try and make sure it gets there. Okay. Any other questions for Michael that? No, okay, nobody's gonna say any more, Peter. But you need a uh, so, motion. 
Do we need to vote? A motion vote? to a motion to endorse the work plan as presented. Bill or Liz? I'll second I'd be it. glad to make that motion. Okay. Uh, and you seconded it, Liz? Yeah. We have we have limited opportunities here. Um, <laughs> okay, so all in favor of the motion, which is to endorse the work plan presented by uh, the Town Trails Committee, please say aye. 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 Okay. We've done it, Michael. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. We'll keep you posted. Okay. Uh, next on the hit list here is highway report update on town roads and discussion about how road crew gets time off in the winter action possible. Victor. You there, Victor? I am here, Peter. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I think Shane's here. Yeah, see, there he is. But yeah, anyway, um, uh, it, the, uh, yeah, they brought up the question of, uh, it's basically the 40 hour work week and how you take time off uh, uh, when, when, once you've worked 40 hours. But maybe Shane, uh, can huh? explain that uh, we had a discussion today about it. And uh, all, when I say we, uh, Shane and the whole crew uh, uh, met and uh, had a discussion about it and the questions that they have. And I think Shane can probably fill you in better than I can. Okay, Shane. All right. So I'll give you a scenario. A couple of weeks ago, one of the guys asked for Tuesday off to bring a significant other to the hospital for a procedure. And I said, yeah, that was fine. Okay. So we worked physically worked 41 hours that week. So I put in 40 hours of regular time, eight hours of vacation time, one hour of overtime. And I was told the way our policy reads, he cannot take vacation time after 40 hours because that's buying time. And I can't find it in the policy, so I would like clarification on that because that's saying if we work 40 hours, for instance, we have bad storms or whatever, we work 40 hours, by Wednesday afternoon we have 40 hours in. Someone gets sick Thursday and Friday, we're being told that you can't put sick time out because the town doesn't buy time. Well, that's not buying time if it's a scheduled work, in my opinion. So uh, we need clarification on this because those eight hours got taken away from the employee and you only got paid to 41 hours. I guess I'm confused. So Dorinda, can you tell me what happened here or explain to us what happened here? Our work week is based on 40 hours per week. So once the, and we, this has been being since I've been on, before I was on, we pay up to 40 hours. The employee got their 40 hours pay and then put in for an extra eight hours of vacation time. We don't pay for anything over 40 hours unless it's overtime um, for time worked. Otherwise, that is buying back your vacation and sick time. And we have never paid it and it's never come up before, but our work week is 40 hours, not 48 hours. That's what we budget for. And this is a policy we have been following since, since I was on the select board. So, and as, so I just am following, I don't make up these rules, I follow them and this is yeah. the same discussion we had the previous pay period when somebody put in for sick time when they had already worked their 40 hours. Sure. And it's buying back time. But if it's time owed to you and it's a regular scheduled work day that you took off, I don't understand how that's buying time. The only thing it says it can't be used for is towards overtime, and it wouldn't be. It'd be paid at your regular time. 
that's where I'm confused. That, that's what I'm trying to understand. So the guys can't take any time off or they can't get sick after they put 40 hours in because they're not going to get paid for it, even if they have it coming to them. But they already got their 40 hours. Nobody right. took away their 40 hour work week. It's not a, it's not a 48 hour work week. It's not a 54 hour work week. It is a 40 hour work week. They already got paid for 40. Nobody took a penny of their time away from them. If anything, he still got the day off. He didn't lose any vacation time. He didn't lose any sick time. And he got paid for the full week plus overtime. Mm -hmm. So he got Phil. the day off. Phil. Right. Um, yeah, when we. Was it last meeting we started having this discussion about how overtime was calculated? And I, I yeah. went and looked at the, I think it's the U.S. Department of Labor site, but I can't be sure now, um, to look at, again, what the federal um, regulations were about how you calculate overtime. And so, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. It's exactly the same thing. Once you've worked the 40 hours, you are whole. You don't need vacation time. You don't need sick time. You've worked your 40 hours. So, you, you know, you, you can't take time beyond that. Um, it, it just it just doesn't calculate, you know, it's, it's 40 hours. If he had 41, then he had an hour of overtime. But then if he's, you know, he just doesn't need sick time because he's worked his whole week. And can I just clarify that overtime, Durinda, I think you've said this before, and I think this is the federal rule, overtime can be paid only for 40 physical hours that include real work time over yes. those 40 hours. Not, I took three days of vacation and then worked um, for the, the rest of the week, I suddenly had to work 12 hour days. Right. That's only 36 hours and I still don't get overtime even though I took two vacation days or whatever. Correct. Um, it, well, that becomes a policy within the how you want to what you want to put into your overtime hours. You know, it, it's still overtime. The federal law is overtime does not start until after 40 hours physically work. Now, if some you want to adopt a policy that says, which we already include holiday time, if you want to include sick time, vacation time, personal time, and then have that part of it and then still pay um, on that, then, then that's a different scenario. That would be a personnel policy that mm -hmm. you would have to put in place. But the federal law is physically work 40 hours. And that's always been, and that's always been the way we've handled it, right? Always. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know why all of a sudden, every meeting, we seem to have some misunderstanding about the way we've been doing things when we're not changing anything. But I guess we do. So we need to deal with them. But does does that make sense to you, Shane? Well, it does. I just wanted to make, I mean, it does, it does and it doesn't. I, I mean, like I said, in Marshfield, they did it by the day. You, if you're on an eight hour day or a 10 hour day, depending on what time of year you're on, you got overtime on the day, not the 40 hour week. So you can still take a day off and get paid regular time. I guess the only concern I have is now with the policy of only being able to carry over 120 hours of vacation time. So now we're going to go into May 1st, unless we have some lull in the weather and we're going to May 1st. And if he has all this vacation time built up, he's going to have to take it all off when we're getting ready to start our busy season. That's all I was concerned about. I wanted to make sure well, I'm putting the timing right. I was supposed to be put in and I wasn't aware of that. Right. I knew I didn't get paid overtime for it. I knew that, but I figured I'd, thought if you were due owed vacation time you should be able to get paid vacation time anytime because it's not any extra you're already earning it yeah but that's like saying i want to get vacation time for every saturday and sunday until i use up all my vacation time 
right? No, because he took a day off during a regular scheduled work week. That's what my point was. Now, I understand there, you can't buy vacation. Buying vacation to me would be on a day you don't normally work. Now, if you have to take a day off for something like um, one of the employees did, and it was early in the week, and then we end up putting all these extra hours in, so then he can't use his vacation time. I mean, it's time that you guys are going to pay one way or the other. So well, Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why can't he use his vacation time? Because he worked over 40 hours that week. He took a Tuesday off. And because the whole work week was over 40 hours, he can't take eight hours vacation time too. Now I'm getting, now I'm getting, tell me what it, tell me exactly what his situation is again. He took one day off during the week and then he worked on Tuesday on a Saturday. It must've been the Saturday before and then whatever we worked throughout the week and it put him at 41 hours actual work time. So the way the policy is, he can't take the eight hours vacation time for Tuesday because he put in 40 hours of work time throughout the week. Right. Cause then he wanted to be paid for 49 hours. Right. I guess I'm confused because it, uh, so there was no need to take vacation or sick. So, but he had worked forty before that. But when he took the day off, he didn't have forty hours. That's where I'm I'm getting at. Then he worked the rest of the week. It was a day he had to take off. Randy has a comment. Okay. So. Uh, some of this really comes down to uh, a budget, right? So you're budgeted for 225 hours of overtime. You're budgeted for whatever your allotment for sick time is, whatever your allotment is for vacation time. And there's some sort of expectation of what time gets, gets planned for in the budget. So think about it this way, Shane. If um, let's just say, for example, we get hellish winter, all, hellish snow all winter long. You guys are working all your, all kinds of overtime. Um, and, and folks were allowed to bill for sick time and uh, vacation time through, through the winter or whatever. And all of a sudden you're, you're beyond what has even been put in the budget for funding um, for any of this. Um, you're you're essentially burdening the taxpayers twice with, um, uh, with time that they wouldn't have had to have paid during that uh, that budget cycle. Well, I guess not really. If the fiscal year starts in July, and he has. 15 days or 120 hours he has to use a vacation time and you're already budgeted for that and he's taking time out of that time you're still paying it whether you're paying it may 1st you're paying it now that's already budgeted for for what not he if, has not if the time. expectation not if the expectation is that the vacation time is taken during time that isn't worked so by saying that they could take it on a Saturday or a Sunday or any week that they're they're working with over forty over forty hours, whatever the timing of it of it may be, you're you're essentially being burdened with it. If they work, if they never took a vacation all summer long, all winter long, and they worked every day through that period, it messes with the way the budgets are looked at and and what are put in for hours. So all of a sudden they're working all kinds of hours and putting in for vacation time. Essentially it's double tapping the budget twice. Is that it, doesn't make sense to me, but. Dorinda, is um, the 2080 hour, the 2080 hour work week, that includes vacation and sick time, doesn't it? Yeah. Right. So Shane, basically if you're, if you're using a vacation day or a sick day, you are taking that in place of working. So you can't work 
our budget is for 40 hours, whether you're working, whether you're sick, or whether you're on vacation or taking a personal day, those 40 hours are what we budget. And so for him to get paid 49 hours is outside the budget because we already paid him 40 for his physical work. And I, and, and in, a, in, a, in a sense, he's kind of working overtime, right? Because he took a sick day. And if you counted that, it really would be, you know, 50 hours of work. But, the, but he physically didn't work for more than 40, except for that one hour. So we can't pay him overtime. And by giving him vacation, then that's going into some weird, um, like, place that we don't go, <laughs> essentially, on a budget. It just doesn't really work that way. Unless we had some policy that our 40 hours work, you get overtime, which we don't. And that's what Dorinda was saying. We would need to change our policy to say that it doesn't matter what your 40 hours are, physical, um, personal sick day or vacation, any hours above that, we pay you overtime. But that's not how yeah, business that isn't is the, That isn't the, that isn't the, no, that isn't the law. I'm saying people don't do it that way. Like that's not, that would get very expensive to do it that way, to start paying overtime above and beyond vacation and and sick time right and it, and even if you're even if it's paying that straight time you know with the 225 hours that are budgeted here you're really budgeting including all of your sick and vacation and everything else you've got 2305 hours throughout the throughout the year that you have budgeted including that 225 of overtime so if folks are allowed to work through all of this time and then bill on top of that their, their vacation and sick time, you're going to be extended past that budget and you're exceeding what your budgeted amount is. That's the easiest way to explain it that I can think of. I All guess, right, I, get it. I guess the other piece of this, the other piece of this that I would say is, so ignoring the budget, but trying to be, but trying to be fair to our employees and follow the rules and regulations the bottom line is one of the reasons we have a four person road crew instead of a three person road crew is so that if somebody needs to take a sick day or a vacation day to take care of personal business or whatever it is, that's fine. We have, we have, we have people to cover it. Now, if all of a sudden, if all of a sudden we have, you know, two people out sick and somebody needs to take a vacation day, Obviously, obviously, that's a problem. But um, the whole idea is that people can take their vacation when they need to take it. And if that means for a good portion of the year, and believe me, I, I manage people and I always used to say, how come nobody ever ever working? Everybody seems to be gone all the time. Well, <laughs> everybody's taking their vacation and their personal time and their sick time. And it adds up to a lot of time. And which is another reason but we why should be able to we should be able to manage our manage our work so that we can get by with you know as much as possible people working the 40 hours and then when they have to work overtime they get paid overtime but over 40 hours of actual work which is why we don't allow people to carry that much over because it's a it's a budget thing so like and why you don't pay people out. Oh, I didn't use any of my vacation this year. Well, one, that's bad that people don't take vacation, but two, it's not in the budget because that's, it's our, your vacation is already included in your salary. All right. That's understandable. I mean, I, you know, I guess the, the, the last piece of this, just, just to say it again is we want people to take the time they're entitled to. And, you know, the only proviso to that is that we reserve the right to manage vacation time. If all of a sudden three people want to take the same week off in the wintertime, that obviously isn't going to work. So you have to say, yeah. OK, you know, Fred gets first choice this time and Harry gets first choice the next time or however it works. It's a challenge. 
but um you know it is it is it is what it is and I, and I know the guys understand that in the in the winter time it's challenging for them to take time off and you know they need to do it in the in the late spring early fall and and summer right but this was just something unexpected that came up so yeah but they're but, always I understand but they're always there are always unexpected things that come up, you know, family, family emergencies, you know, who knows, who knows what I get it. Um, right. but again, that's, that's part of the reason we have a four man road crew is that we can, when we need to, um, do the work we need to do with, with three people. All right. So bottom line, not is the greatest. We budget for 40 yeah, hours. Bottom line is we budget for 40 hours and then budget for overtime. So you stick to your 40 hours unless it's overtime because we get some hellacious weeks or something. Um, but other than that, you stick right to the 40 hours. Right. And yeah. those 40 hours include vacation and right. personal time. Okay. And sick time. Right. That's built into the 40 hour work week. But the overtime is only paid when you've worked physically yeah, 40 physically hours. Work. Yeah. Or which that could, included a which holiday. Which could happen. Though. I mean, let's say. With the holiday. Let's say, With the holiday. Right. But let's say, for instance, let's say, for instance, somebody takes a couple of vacation days or sick days, Monday and Tuesday. And our, <laughs> what, is our, what is our pay week during it? Does it go, does it go Saturday through Friday? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so let's say, let's say on Saturday and Sunday, there's a hell of a snowstorm and everybody has to put in eight at just for simple things. And it might be more than this eight hours on those two days. Okay. So they've worked 16 hours. Now it's Monday. Then they take uh, a sick day on Monday and Tuesday. So they've got 16 work hours and they're going to be paid for 32 hours. Then Thursday and Friday, they work another two days. They're up to the 40 hours. If they work in those days any more than the 40 hours, they would get overtime for those extra. No, it, their sick time would not be used for the Monday and Tuesday. When, when, they, when they took that time off, you essentially wouldn't submit for the time, whether it be sick or vacation, and you would only submit for the worked hours up to that 40. If they went over the 40 for worked hours, they would get overtime for the over the over that. But essentially they would what, not, I think that's what I said, Randy. You said that they'd but be they paid overtime. Paid. No, it isn't, Peter. They only get paid overtime when they get 40 hours of actual work time. Not <laughs> counting sick vacation and personal time. I think Correct. they would adjust their sick hours and not not use them if they went over if they ended up physically working say 45 hours because that's what happened but they'd already taken two sick days they would reduce their sick hours they would they would go back to their timesheets and say i didn't i wasn't sick for 16 hours i was only sick for five hours and then save their sick time and essentially, they're still getting those two days off, and it's not taking away from any of their sick time. Right. right. Or vacation time or whatever. Or whatever. They, they'll right. get it back. Yeah. 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 Right. I think we beat this to death. It's yep. too. <laughs> well, I wasn't at the last meeting, so I, I wanted to clarify myself. No, that's fine, Shane. That's fine. The roads are looking good, Shane, by the way, with all that ice that you had to deal with. No, I'm hoping we don't get any more ice. I'm sick of ice. I know. <laughs> I wear my crampons, yeah. but so far I that's haven't good, fallen. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good hope. <laughs> Whether yeah, it'll ever it come true or not, who knows. But yeah, yeah, I'm ready for a good, good old-fashioned snowstorm. Yeah, yeah, me too. Maybe this weekend. Yes. Really? Is that what they're saying? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it sounds like, depending on who you believe, it's either going out yeah. to sea or it isn't. So we got to wait and see. I'm going to believe Phil and Shane. 
Thank you, Shane. Anything sure. anything else to report on the uh, roads, either Vic or Shane? Uh, no, just been busy, that's all. And I'm getting a little bit of a break now, so doing some maintenance and probably bring the grader out tomorrow if it's that warm. And we're going to try to knock off some of the high spots and try to get them cleaned up a little bit so not so rough if we can. Nice. Sounds like a plan. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thanks, Shane. Okay. Thanks, thank you, Shane. Shane. All right. So it is now 10 after 7. And and don't get me uh, don't get me wrong, but uh, I think we need to spend some real time on this uh, use of the use of the school business. And I know uh, Chris is very anxious for us to uh, us to get back to them, but I still have some concerns and questions about it. And it's everybody's tired, and I'm tired, and it's late, and I'm going to suggest that we defer that discussion till our next meeting. Um, Chris, I, I, I still. Whoop, Peter. I'm I'm Liz? I'm anxious, but not about the policy. Um, I'm anxious about asking you folks to reconsider the vote so we can send out ballots. Chris. Um, the policy, you know, I'm, um, you know, I'm happy to come back and talk about the policy. It's a proposal, um, you know, and, and it can be tweaked. And my goal in, in drafting it was to um, recognize the legal reality of the easement um, um, and, and maintaining access, but also the fact that I have to take into account the school schedule. And so that was the real goal of the policy, but making it crystal clear that there's a legal uh, entitlement to access to the building and the, and the, and the properties. Um, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, Can I just ask a question? Chris, you asked us for comment, um, but it looked like the only thing that we could comment on was like that final page that was sort of about because the other stuff was already part of the agreement when we sold it to them for ten dollars. So this um, was it, just a COVID thing, right? Like a temporary thing. It's you know the comments right. was, are just are the procedure itself in terms of um, uh, the access and how to maintain the access and how to how to approach the school because not all the community members are going to have keys and so how do we set that up so that if someone wants to use the the building. The mechanism of ensuring that that happens. So nice. tweaking that pro process um, and thoughts and okay. comments on that um, is great. We, yeah, we can't change the legal definitions or the um, right. what is actually the description in the easement itself, but how to make that a reality is what the, okay. the policy, the procedure can can deal with. Gotcha. Okay. Sarah, you had a question for Chris. Um, I was asking him if you wanted us to make a, if you, if he was asking for a vote tonight, because it wasn't warned. I thought it was on the agenda before, not this one. I thought I saw an agenda before that, that was on there. No. no? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when, when is your next meeting? Well, I don't want to speak for the board, but I think that they've already discussed, they've already talked about the fact that they're going to pick up this issue next Tuesday at a special meeting when the oh, okay. legislature decides whether or not town floor, floor vote towns like ours can, um, can hold the uh, town meeting by Australian ballot until, and that was one of the sticking points as you recall back in December for the board. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to come. You, you're talking about next Tuesday, a week from now? We're gonna, they're going to do the budget. Yeah, we'll let, the we'll let you know. Okay, that'd be great. And then, uh, and again, and let's the... just, and let's just, I, I just, I just want, want a little more time to carefully read through all that stuff. I guess it does. It, I'll just make one comment. I mean, it does make sense to me that the principal needs to be the gatekeeper, not the superintendent, and that the principal you know, needs to be very careful that he doesn't unreasonably say, you know, the school schedule always has priority. So if there's a conflict, the town's in second place. Mm -hmm. But I guess we just got to, we just got to work on that and have a good relationship with the principal and 
and do that. I don't think there's any other uh, any other way to do it. And if it if it doesn't work, if we feel like if we feel like we're getting refused access uh, unnecessarily, then you know we got to fall back to the easement and say, hey, this isn't working. You're not honoring your easement. And so Peter, the goal was to you know limit the principal's discretion to say no. Um, you Correct. Know, that, like, and I saw yeah, that, that in there. That was I, my goal. I appreciate that. And it was and it was also trying to coordinate. You know, not having the um, uh, like the health officer at the school make the unilateral decision on whether COVID's over or not. It's uh, coordinated. Do we have? Right. Does Middlesex have a health officer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Who? Uh, Dr. Oh. Penny. Oh, okay. So that's why I was incorporating that as a collaboration uh, between the two, as opposed to delegation to one or the other. All right. Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe anyway. we're most of the way. Maybe we're most of the way being comfortable with this after all, but let's, let's, uh, let's put the, put the voting business on the agenda for uh, our likely uh, January 11th meeting. If not, it would be the 16th. No, it would be the 18th. 18th. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chris. See you later. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Yep. Bye. Okay. How are we doing? Approving minutes of the December 22nd, 21 select board meeting action likely. Is there a motion? Uh, so moved. I'll second it. Okay. Thank you. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Okay. We've approved the minutes. Renewing a class two liquor license for the Roots Farm Market action likely. This is the current license that they have, right, Sarah? Yeah. yeah. Move approval. Just a renewal. Yep. Just an okay. approval. Okay. Liz? I'll second it. Okay. Thank you. Um, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes. Um, we all got a copy of the uh, Vermont Equalization Study results. Um, no surprise, no, no surprise there. We're going to be uh, likely headed for a reappraisal, but we don't have to do it right now. So that's the good news. Yeah. Anybody have any any questions on that? It was pretty self-explanatory, I think. Mm hmm Okay. Um, receiving Here. Bill McManus's whoop. Yes. No, no. I, before that, uh, we need, I was trying to amend the, the agenda before, but I couldn't get in. We have um, Morris Knight. I think I sent this to you. I was going to put this under, uh, kind of under correspondent. He lives in on uh, near the class four section of North Bear Swamp Road. I think yep. he's here in this meeting. Yep, yep, yep. And did you guys all read his letter? Yes, I did. Okay. So, so he is here. I he's thought. Hmm. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I thought we agreed we were going to put up a sign in addition to the boulder and that we were not going to block off both ends of the road. Is that not what we talked about, Vic? I think he's gone. Um, no, I'm not gone. gone. I'm not gone. Uh, no, yes, no. Uh, no, we didn't agree on that, Peter. We, uh, you're not going to. You've got to cover, you've got to close the other end. I mean, I think that's the only responsible thing to do. If somebody gets out there, and then they have to turn around and come all the way back. So if they can, you know, if they ran into us, all kinds of scenarios. Right. I know. So, we went, so, I, guess, we went so I guess the question is, if we, I, I know we discussed putting up a sign, but maybe we didn't decide to. I mean, my only question in reading this thing is, does it make sense to put a sign up? It does on the rock side, like the guy says, because you can't see the rock that gets covered with snow. But our side, would, um, they they uh, they uh, painted it up and uh, and uh, and so that it could be seen. But there's no sign on it saying closed for the winter. Or... No, I think the uh, we just thought the handwriting was on the wall when you saw the. Uh, Barricade the concrete barricades there with the uh, 
uh, red red marks. I mean, orange marks. Who put up the bar the barricades? We did. We, we did. did. Yeah. We did. So, and I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know, I must have zoned out when we were talking about this. I, I, I feel like this is like uh, Groundhog Day. We've talked about the Stam stretch of road so many times over the years. I, I get them mixed up. Well, I, guess, I guess my... Con I'm sorry? Oh, we were just getting kind of confused on it, too, because, uh, or I was, I guess I could only speak for myself. But, you know, at one time we talked, Peter and I talked, uh, we weren't going to close it. And then we were going to close it. Uh, and then it came to us right. that we were going to close it. So then you you told me to notify uh, Rupert uh, to put the rock up there. And uh, yep. yeah, and then we, then we, uh, we said we talked. I talked it over with the crew there, and it's well, geez, you gotta put something on the other side because uh, might not be a place to turn around once you got over there. If yeah, <laughs> amen. Right, amen. Um, I, I guess the only question I have is if, if we need to do whether it's whether it's a sign or a or some kind of another barricade that makes it obvious that the roads close rather than just a rock that's going to get covered with snow. And I don't know the answer to that. Can people drive around the rock? Is there a room where they can drive around it? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. But don't we have those signs left over from the old McCullough Hill there? It said uh, something about being closed due to uh, for the winter months. This road is closed for yep. the winter months. That would be good. Yep. We'll see if we can dig those up. I don't know where they'd be. I yeah, mean, see if we can dig them up. I mean, it can't can't be that expensive to create something. All I know, all I know is that 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 until somehow that road gets improved and you know that parking lot can be open in the winter and the state's got to plow it or whatever, it's going to be an ongoing problem. It's never going to go away, and it doesn't seem fair to me that it's the town's responsibility to have to deal with this problem. But I guess it is. And I'm certainly not suggesting that we we budget the money to upgrade that stretch of road and start plowing the state parking lot. So we've got what we've got, but I think it does make sense to try and put signs up if we can find them. Right. Does that make I'll sense to you, Liz and uh, yes. Bill? Yes. Yep. Yes, it does. Okay. I'll ask. Uh... So should we? Our our response our response to this letter is that. Um, it is the best judgment of the select board that the road needs to be closed in the winter due to all the all the conditions and problems which have existed over time, and that we agree that uh, signs should be posted and they will be posted. And if we can't find the old signs, make some new ones. Yeah, sounds right. That make that makes sense to everybody. Just I mean, we should respond yep. to his letter. Is all yep. I'm saying. So Sarah, if you could just. You could just write a letter and, and, and sign it for the board and just say we we discussed his letter and we appreciate his concern. We're trying to address uh, an ongoing problem, which I believe he's very aware of. And uh, opening the road in the wintertime is not the is not the answer. But okay, okay. signs will. Go ahead. I just said, OK. Oh, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter, you we want need to, to accept? Okay. Yep. Yeah. I would just uh, have you, you sign accept. it on behalf of the select board, Sarah. Okay. Just, just get it out. All right. Um, uh, we need to acknowledge receipt of Bill McManus's resignation from the budget committee effective March 1st. Um, so Second. Liz, you'll second that? Yeah. Okay. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 I'd like to uh, acknowledge have... his service to us and tell him thank yep. you. Yes, we should. Don't forget to do that. <laughs> aye. 
however we do it. Um, but we should in accepting his, why don't we, why don't we just send him the letter and say, you know, we accept your, uh, your resignation with regret and we appreciate your, uh, your service to the town. Thank you very much. Or something like that. Sarah. Okay. Yep. Okay. And, uh, Orders. I'll stop down tomorrow morning and sign the orders. It sounds like, Liz, you need to do it this time because both Mary and Steve are out of town. Dang! And I will be, uh, I'll stop by tomorrow also. Wash your okay. hands. What's that? Wash your hands. It's six central okay. down here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Pass Wait, no, no, <laughs> Peter. No, no, you have two things you what? want to talk about. One is, what you wanted to talk about how select board meetings are going to go forward if they're going yes, to still thank you. So my recommendation <laughs> based on what we're seeing going on every day is that we continue to have our select board meetings by Zoom until further notice. And when we get through this, we can we can change. But uh, I don't see us uh, I don't see us resuming our in-person meetings. I agree. Unless anybody disagrees. No. So we probably need we probably need a motion just to get something in the minutes that we agree to that. Okay. But we still have to have someone at the town hall, right? Yep. Yeah. Because okay. unless now who knows? The the uh my understanding is that um the legislature is considering the whole town meeting day issue, and I believe they're going to be talking about select board things at the same time, although I'm not sure. Uh, so they may, you know, they may waive that again and make it easier for us to be remote. But they're remote. I, just, I, yeah. I just can't see all of us piling into the town hall right now. That makes no sense. So you're going to make a motion, Phil, for Liz? Sure. Um, <laughs> I am moved that we continue to hold select board meetings remotely uh, with one person physically uh, present at town hall um, until, what should we say, for the next six months, and we'll review it at that time? Uh, let's just say, let's just say until, until further notice. Until further notice, okay. I that way, that. that way we don't forget, and then we're <laughs> okay. Yep. You seconded it, Liz. I did. Okay. Good work. Okay. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Okay. Um, so I guess the only remaining question is: um, Are we going to try and or not try? Are we going to uh, warn a special select board meeting for the 11th to finalize the budget and deal with the question of how we uh, how we uh, how we deal with town meeting? Yes. Or do we just or do we just wait till the 18th? We can wait until the 18th. Are we on? I believe we can. Okay. Yeah, I think That's we should wait for the 18th. Not having an extra meeting is fine by me. <laughs> but wait, we're still having okay. a meeting next week, right? That's what you're talking about. What? That's what no, you're talking we're about. No, we're saying we would not have the meeting next week. We would wait till the 18th. But wait, I thought Dorinda. we agreed on it for another reason. Dorinda? Um, say, uh, whatever your name is, Sarah, would that give us time? I mean, if we don't approve the budget for two weeks, because I can't do any report until I have an approved budget. You know, I hate to say it, but frankly, I think you guys would probably just benefit by having a special meeting on Tuesday. And I don't, uh, there's no one who doesn't want this more than I do. I don't think you have to approve about, uh, I don't think you have to rush anything about town meeting um, or sending out the school ballots for the, for the, for the school, because it's a complicated issue. And, um, 
there's no reason to rush it. I mean, the school district may want it, but they can't get their they can't get their uh, warning done until the 15th either. So I don't know why they're trying to ram this down our throats. It's, you know, there's no reason. <coughs> but we do want to do well, the budget next to be week. You might want to do the budget next week. I think it would probably free up a lot of time. Plus, we've got Russ Bennett is coming in on the 18th to talk about to do a presentation on the Colby property. And you guys are going to have to approve the warning and you're going to have to approve the select board report. And I'm sure okay. part of that is going to be assigning Phil to write a budget addendum like he always does. So, um, you know, it would be nice if, if all that were tidied up in a bow on yeah, the 18th. So just meet uh, just yeah, on I don't the 11th. So can we make it a one item agenda, which is we just sure strictly? Can. Okay. Let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, but you should tell Chris because I think he's assuming he's going to be there for this meeting. I'll tell Chris. Yeah. Okay. So special. Okay. Meeting. Good resolution. <coughs> okay. Bye, Peter. Are you okay? Yeah. I am okay. My my throat's just dry. I had a negative uh -oh. COVID test today. You'll be glad to know. Hey, listen, I'm going to tell you something. In my COVID exposure, everybody was testing negative right up until New Year's Eve when they were also testing negative. And then on New Year's Day, they all tested positive. I'm drinking up oh, yeah. well. <laughs> well, I'm now, I now have no rapid tests and I can't figure out where to get them. So you can't, you can't find one anywhere. <laughs> Wait in line behind I'm the burger. Down. Yeah, they're fast. They're not. I'm still waiting for my results. Really? If I took it 9 a.m. yesterday. Oh, yeah, no, it, it takes like two days to get it. But. I hope you don't have it. Yeah, me thanks. too. Oh. Yeah, I hope, you, I hope you don't have it too, sir. Because I was right, right, Vic and I were right next to each other today, and I think I scared him. Oh. Well, I had <laughs> fever, body aches, and headache for a day and a half, and I tested negative on a rapid, you know, PCR test. Good. Who knows? Great. Well, Dorinda said Dorinda said she had the real flu, not COVID, but the real flu. So uh, there's, there, that's what I might there are other unpleasant bugs going around. Exactly. Flu is on the rise this year again. Okay, so just to recap, you're meeting on the 11th just to talk about the budget. That's yes. it. Yep. Okay. Great. Okay. We done? Looks okay. Like yes. Okay. I hereby declare, boy, I've got a pile of papers on my desk and each eye. Um, Sarah, I need to, um, I'll give you a call, but there's definitely something going on with my zoom and I don't know if I need to delete the program and reload it or whatever I need to do, but I may need your help to do a little test with me. Why'd you buy a new computer? You mean you don't think my, my five-year-old computer is okay? No, no, it's, it's not. Get a, new one. Get a new one. <laughs> Okay, bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.